Happy Sunday and welcome to church. Whether you're joining us in person or watching church online, we're so glad that you made the decision to join us today. We believe that community to start the week off in God's house is so refreshing and so important. So we wanna encourage you, if you haven't yet joined us for an in-person service, maybe next week is your week to do so. And a reminder, if you have been attending, that it's very important that you register on Tuesday because the seats are going really fast. So just a reminder, we have four in-person services on Sunday and we'd love to have you join us for one of those. This Wednesday is our annual report at seven o'clock here at the church. We've told you about that for the past few weeks, but just a reminder, if you're planning to attend, that you need to email the church office and register as seating is limited. And also a reminder that our regular Wednesday programming is not happening this week because of the annual report. So if you're planning to come for a connect group, don't show up and think Connect Group's happening, but those will be running again next week on Wednesday night. Just a reminder that all of our regular programming, aside from Wednesday, is still happening this week, so make sure you connect in one of our Connect Groups. And stay tuned to our social media or check out our church online calendar for everything you need to know about our Connect Groups. There's three ways that you can continue to give into God's house right here at Gateway. The first is by giving in person here on Sunday mornings. You can drop your giving in one of the giving boxes in the auditorium, or you can always drop your giving off anytime throughout the week to the church office. The second way you can give is by giving online. And the third way to give is by texting the word GIVE to the number that's appearing on the screen right now. And thank you, Gateway, for your generosity, your obedience to God's word, and partnering with us as we endeavor to advance God's kingdom right here in Regina and with our missions commitments in Asia. Speaking of our giving commitments in Asia, before we get into worship, we want to give you a quick update on our children's home in Cambodia, Gateway Cambodia. Taka and Christina, our fearless leaders, send their love to all of you and thank you for your continued giving and supporting what they're doing in Cambodia. As we are in the midst of a COVID season right here in Canada, they're experiencing the same in Cambodia and have been navigating online school with all of their 20 some kids in the Gateway House. So as you can imagine, it's been a little bit of a crazy year, but they're pressing on and with God's grace, they figured out a system and things are going well for their online school. There's new kids in the Gateway family that are young, but also some of the Gateway Cambodia kids have grown up and now we're seeing them adventure off into getting jobs and going to college and even getting married. One of the Gateway girls got married last year and now her and her husband have just had their first child, a beautiful baby girl. So in the pictures that are coming up, you'll see a little bit of what I've mentioned. You'll see the Gateway kids doing online school. You'll see some of the fun they're having, some of them at their new jobs. And also you'll see the newest Gateway member making Taka and Christina grandparents with the newest little baby girl there. So we're just so excited. We hope you enjoy these pictures. And once the pictures are done, then we'll get up and worship together.
thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Let's just prepare our hearts, church. Let's just work on, let's just welcome the Holy Spirit as we sing this song.
church. Thank you, Jesus. We worship you, Jesus. We just want to lift your name high. Hosanna in the highest. Receive our worship, God.
Can we just sing one more time? Hosanna. Sing. Another worship encounter with you, together with everyone, your body. We declare Hosanna in the highest to our King. Thank you. And we say amen to this worship. All glory belongs to you. Thank you, Jesus. Hey, Gateway, Pastor Brian here. Thanks for taking the time to join us today for Online Church. Today we begin a brand new series of of teachings, and this is on the theme of friendship. How do you feel about friendship? Sure beats the alternative, doesn't it? You know, one day there was a little girl who asked her mom for permission to go outside and play in the backyard, and the uh, next-door neighbors, they had three young boys, and the mom said, no, darling, you can't because boys are too rough. The little girl was quiet for a moment, and she said, Mom, if I find a boy that's smooth, can I play with him? I'm thinking to myself, young lady, when you grow up, if you find a guy that is smooth, that's probably the fellow that you want to steer clear of. Well, today we're going to be talking about friendship, but before we crack this series open, come on, would you boldly repeat after me, I love God, therefore I love the Word of God, the teachings of Jesus, are my greatest counsel. My pride and passion is to follow his example. Now say this, the Bible is truth to my spirit, joy to my soul, and health to my body. Help me, Lord, to know the book and walk the walk. All right, if you can say amen to that, then we're good to go. And let's get into God's word today and allow God's word to get into us. Uh, You know what I mean when I say there are certain trios of names that are very recognizable. For example, if I said Larry, Moe, and probably you would say Curly Joe, unless you're really young and are not familiar with the group that we call the Three Stooges. Or how about this, Huey, Dewey, and Louie. Yeah, you remember them, those little rascals, they are the nephews of Donald Duck. How about this? Have you ever heard the expression, not just any old Tom, Dick, and Harry? Or some of you might be old enough to remember these names, Peter, Paul, and Mary. Not talking about the ones from the Bible. Talking about back in the 1960s, there was a very popular music group called Peter, Paul, and Mary. But here's here's a set of names that does come from the scriptures. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Remember them, the three Hebrew young men that were tossed into the fiery furnace back in the book of Daniel. Somebody suggested that 
That makes a great bedtime story. Today, I'm going to read to you about Shadrach, Meshach, and to bed you go. You see, whether it be partners of a law firm or partners of a rock band or partners in crime or partners in ministry, there are certain sets of three names that have become familiar to us, right? And I hope that I hope that's going to be really true over the next few weeks with this particular set of names, Peter, James, and John. Yeah, they were the trio of fishermen that became Jesus' closest companions. So here we go. We know that Jesus had a hand-picked team of a dozen disciples, right? But did you know that within that circle uh, that was known as the Twelve, did you realize that Jesus had an inner circle of three guys that he was especially close to? Yeah, that'd be Peter, James, and John. So you got Simon, and he was the one that Jesus renamed so that he was known as Peter, right? Peter means rock. And then, of course, there was the, the other two guys, James and John. They were the sons of Zebedee. They were brothers. And Jesus gave them a nickname. He called them the Sons of Thunder. Yeah, I know. It sounds like a motorcycle gang, right? So Peter, James, and John, they were Jesus' go-to guys. You know, as you follow the travels of the 13, you're going to find that there were some occasions where Jesus took these three amigos with him and he left the rest of the disciples behind. No offense, but there were times when Jesus said to the rest, you guys stay here. Peter, James, John, come with me. One of those instances is in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 9. This is the event that was known as the transfiguration of Christ. I want to read from verse 2, Mark 9, verse 2. Here's what it says. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and led them up a high mountain where they were all alone. There he was transfigured. Jesus was transfigured before the, the eyes of of Peter, James, and John. And it says, His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could ever bleach them. And there appeared before them Elijah and Moses, who were talking with Jesus. One of the other gospel writers describes this same event, and he adds this detail, that they were talking with Jesus about His departure. So this is going to be unfolding in the near future. Jesus would be going to the cross, followed by his resurrection, and then his departure. We call it the ascension when he would return to the right hand of the Father, mission accomplished. And so Jesus is discussing these matters and no doubt receiving some encouragement from Elijah and and Moses. They're saying, man, you can do this. God strengthen you, Jesus. You can handle that cross. And so, and so they're discussing these things up on top of that mountain. And here's Peter, James, and John looking on and kind of eavesdropping on this conversation. And, and certainly they must have been feeling like, wow, it is quite a privilege for us to be here included in this mountaintop experience. All right, let's go over to Mark chapter 5. This was another instance where we see Jesus leaving some of the disciples behind and taking Peter, James, and John with him. So one of the leaders of the synagogue, this guy's name was Jairus. So he's one of the leaders in the, in the local church. But his daughter, she was 12 years old and she was seriously ill. And so Jairus, he takes off and he tracks down Jesus. And he begs Jesus, would you please come to my place and heal my girl? And, and Jesus is like, I'd be happy to do that. Just lead the way. And so they're about to, to, to head over to Jairus' place. And just then in the press of the crowd, do you remember the case of the, the woman who had an issue of blood? And, and she thought to herself, if I could just reach out and even touch Jesus' clothes, I am pretty sure that, that healing would, would come into my body and and so the Lord honored her faith. That's exactly what happened. And, and so, of course, Jesus stopped and engaged this lady and said, Wow, good for you. Because of your faith, you've been made whole, so go in peace. And so Jesus stopped to attend to this woman, even though he had already committed to Jairus. Yeah, let's go and raise your daughter up from that bed of sickness. And, and here's the way it reads. In Mark chapter 5, we pick it up in verse 35 because... Jesus stopped to attend to the needs of this other woman. 
But then there were some messengers on their way from Jairus' place. Here's what it says. While Jesus was still speaking to the woman, some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? Overhearing what they said, Jesus told him, he told Jairus, he said, don't you worry about it. Do not be afraid. You keep your faith intact. Just believe. Don't listen to these guys. It's going to be all right with your daughter. And so in verse 37, here's what it says. Jesus, he did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. So this is one of those cases where he, he left the other disciples there. And he said, Peter, James, and John, you boys come with me. So verse 38, when they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw a commotion and heard a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly, as you would expect people to do when a little girl has, has died. Verse 39, Jesus went in and said to them, why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but merely asleep. But they laughed at him. After he put them all out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him, Peter, James, and John, and went in where the child was. And of course, you know the rest of the story. He raised that little girl back to life again, and, and it's all good. It was a story with a happy ending, as most all of Jesus' stories are. But listen, he put them out. Jesus asked these people that were wailing and weeping and mocking him for the remark that he made. He asked these people to leave. He said, listen, you guys just all, just, just go. Just get out. You just remove yourselves into the backyard because I need to have an atmosphere of faith to work in here so that we can attend to the need of this little girl. And so he asked them to leave. And then, of course, he did business and raised that girl to life. Now, why did Jesus include his three associates, Peter, James, and John, when he went in to perform that miracle? Was it because he was doing some mentoring? He's wanting to show these guys how it's done. Was it because he was needing some backup right then, you know, some, some prayer support? Because it's obvious the way the, the, uh, the passage reads that Jesus was insisting on an environment of faith that was not interfered with by a bunch of doubt and mockery and scoffing and so on. And, 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 and so was it because he wanted those guys to come with him and just fill that room with faith? Was it because he wanted them to witness the event for the purpose of kind of recording some of the details of, of what took place that day? Why did Jesus say, you three, come with me? I don't know for sure what all of his reasons are. Maybe all of the above. But if I was Peter, James, or John right then, I'd be feeling pretty good about being included. You know, that they were, they were privileged to be accompanying Jesus on this ministry excursion. All right, let me point out one other example where we see the different levels of relationship between Jesus and his disciples. This time we go to Matthew chapter 26. So this is right after the event known as the Last Supper, and Jesus leads his team of disciples out to what I think was Jesus' favorite place of prayer, the Garden of Gethsemane. And so we pick it up in verse 36 of Matthew 26. Here's what it says. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, said to his disciples, at least he said to eight of his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And he took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, James and John. So he took Peter, James and John along with him. And he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Guys, stay here and keep watch with me. Or in some of the translations, it says it this way. Watch and pray. Guys, if I ever needed you to be interceding for me, tonight is that night. Verse 39. Going a little farther, Jesus fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My Father, if it be possible, may this cup be taken from me, and yet not as I will, but as you will. And so we get the picture. They went a certain distance into the garden as a group. And that's where Jesus left eight of them, right? It would have been nine, but by this time, Judas, he had already, remember, he excused himself 
from the, the Last Supper. So he's on his way to do his dirty work and, and uh, you know, swing a deal there with the religious leaders, the 30 pieces of silver, the betrayal of Jesus. So Judas is not with them at this point. He'll be coming later, bringing the soldiers to arrest Jesus. But at this stage, there's eight of the disciples that are left at a certain depth into the garden. And then Jesus, Peter, James, and John, they go further into the garden. And that's where he leaves these three guys. Guys, watch and pray. And then Jesus goes still deeper into the olive grove and, and deeper into prayer while his men were back there a little ways, you know, falling into a deep sleep. So they kind of let him down that night. But for me, it's like a picture of the deeper you go into the garden of prayer, the deeper you progress in your relationship with the Father and the Son. But again, it's a case of Jesus saying to his disciples, follow me. And the three of them were able to follow Jesus further than the rest of the disciples were because they had a closer connect with him. Now, what I want you to see in all of this is that Jesus had a small unit of friends that he really trusted. It's like a model for us of the need for close friendship and support. So within the circle of 12, there was an inner circle of three, right? But then within the inner circle of three, there was one out of those three that was Jesus' right-hand man, his best friend, you could say. That would be John. Now, how do we know that? Because John said so. <laughs> No less than five times in the Gospel of John, he refers to himself as the one whom Jesus loved. But you know what? Probably the best evidence of the super closeness between Jesus and John comes in John chapter 19. And so Jesus here is on the cross. And there's a very, very touching moment that takes place here. Verse 25 of the Gospel of John, chapter 19, it says, Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, so that's Jesus' mother, Mary, and his mother's sister, Jesus' auntie, and Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. So you got Mary, Mary, and Mary. Now, more about those women in a few minutes here. But verse 26 says, When Jesus saw his mother there, and the disciple whom he loved, that's John. He was also standing nearby at the foot of the cross. Jesus said to her, to his mom, Woman, here is your son. He wasn't talking about himself. He was alluding to John. And to the disciple, to John, he said, Here is your mother, referring to Mary. And then the Bible says, From that time on, this disciple, John, took her, Mary, into his home. See, understand, John and his family, they took Mary under their wing and received her into their home from the day of Jesus' crucifixion. No doubt they protected her from any sort of scorn or ridicule that she have, may have faced as the mother of, of Jesus who has freshly been crucified. And you just know what the atmosphere was like in town. And, and, and so John... He and his family, they took care of Jesus' mother, Mary. So the Lord, even from his position on the cross, I mean, the man is in agony, and yet he looks down and he sees his mother. And even at that late hour, he is making arrangements for the welfare of his own mother. He's committing Mary into the care of his dear friend, John. Obviously, Jesus really trusted John. You don't ask somebody. To be the caregiver of your mom. If you don't know them. Know them well. And really trust them. So listen here's the deal. After three and a half years of public ministry. These 13 men. Jesus and his disciples. Well I guess 11 men at this point. But, but after three and a half years. They had been traveling together. They'd been discipling together. They had been meeting people, meeting needs. We're talking about all kinds of miracles. They'd been arguing among themselves. 
They'd been laughing among themselves. They were walking on water. They were climbing mountains. They were encountering demons and telling them where to go. And I mean, put it this way. It was eventful. But when all was said and done, Jesus was close to the 12, or to the 11, 12 minus Judas. He was close to the 11. He was closer to the three, Peter, James, and John. And he was closest to the one. That would be John. Even Jesus needed a small group of close friends. Can I say that again? Even Jesus himself recognized his need for a small group of close friends. And the whole point of this teaching series is, so do we. Yeah, come on. We got, we got to be able to, to, to grasp this. You and I, we also need to have a small group of close friends. This is such a crucial issue. Every one of us needs to have at least the bare minimum, at least one, preferably two or three, possibly even a whole handful of close friends to connect with. May I give you three questions to kind of help us gauge where we're at with this? Question number one is this. If you were getting married in a couple of months, okay, just suppose, if you're going to get married in a couple of months, do you know who would be your best man? Plus a couple of groomsmen. Do you know who they would be? Or, or your maid of honor and a couple of bridesmaids? Or, or would you have to ask that, that guy that's running the, the tuxedo rental shop, uh, by the way, uh, are you busy on the last Saturday of May? I, I really need a best man. Uh, what was your name again? Is that where you'd be at with this? Who's going to stand up with you when you get married? Question number two is this. If you find yourself in a crunch, you know, a dilemma, some kind of crisis comes your way, who do you call? Like, who's your go-to guy when you're in trouble or your go-to gal? You know, there's one lady who moved to L.A., and she was quite apprehensive about driving in the traffic on the freeway. I mean, you got six lanes of traffic going each direction. And so, and so she always stuck exclusively to the outside lane, the one that, that's furthest to the right. And that's always where she drove. And one of her friends that occasionally was with her in the car, finally, her friend said to her, listen, oh, what is with you, girl? Why, why do you always drive? You got six lanes to work with here. Why are you always in the outside lane furthest to the right and and her friend said well because if something were to happen I would have a shoulder to cry on <laughs> so listen whose shoulder do you cry on who are the people that you could call in a time of need somebody that will be there for you mom <laughs> all right question number three is this who's going to be your pallbearer yeah, who's going to carry your casket when the time comes? Do you remember the case of the lady who gave strict instructions? She said, I do not want to have pallbearers for my memorial service. Somebody said, why? She said, she very curtly said, they wouldn't take me out when I was alive, and I don't want to give them the satisfaction of taking me out when I'm dead. All right, okay, okay. As they say over at Burger King, have it your way. Listen, things have really changed. Nowadays, about 80% of funerals are by cremation. So there's not, just not a whole lot of pallbearing being done anymore. But if it came right down to it, who would be the person that would be considered your closest friend that would be the one designated to, to carry your urn? Who would that person be? You know, some people would say, well, I don't, I don't know. I haven't got that far yet. But listen, who's going to be your best man? Or who's the person that you would call when, when there's a pressing need? Or who's the person that will carry your casket? Do you know? You know, over the years, there's been more than a few times when I've heard a woman say to me, Pastor, I feel bad for my husband because he doesn't have friends. Wow, that is not at all uncommon. 
You know, Dr. Larry Crabb, a very renowned and well-respected Christian counselor and author, conducted a survey among 4,000 men. And one of the stats, one of the results of that survey was this. 75% of men indicated that they do not have a close friend that they can talk to on a personal level. Wow. How sad is that? I think we all understand what kind of friendship we're talking about, right? I mean, it's not, it's not 24-7, you know, you got to call this person every day. Not necessarily. I mean, maybe you've got some, some close friends that you do talk to on a daily basis, but it doesn't have to be that much. But somebody that you can hang out with. Somebody you can maybe do some recreation with. You can go for a coffee. You could do lunch together certain times. Somebody you can talk to. You can confide in them or even a person that you can pray together about certain things or you can work on projects together. That's a great thing for, for friends to do. Or learning from each other. Who knows? Maybe you could even do a camping trip together if you're able to do that sort of thing without killing each other. You know, some can't, but... Ladies, maybe it's, it's a, another girl that you can, you can do shopping with. But you, you understand... It's somebody that you enjoy their company, somebody that you trust. You can be yourself with that person. Yeah, that kind of friend. Folks, Jesus of Nazareth clearly understood the importance of a small group of close friends. Now, the question is, do we get it? Do we understand it? You know, back in the 1970s, there was a man by the name of Pepper Rogers. He was the head coach of the football team at UCLA. So we're talking about college football, right? And in 71, he, he developed a new strategy, kind of a, a new system. It was called the wishbone offense. And in that 1971 season, wow, when he put that, that, that new system into play, uh, they had very, very limited success with it during that season. And in the off season, he faced a lot of criticism. Even his wife, who was an avid college football fan, she was upset with him for, for putting that new approach into the playbook. Pepper Rogers was in the doghouse. Years later, he was reflecting on that miserable season. And he said this, My dog was my only true friend. I told my wife that every man needs at least two good friends. And so she bought me another dog. <laughs> oh, that's sad. Now listen, right about now, some of you ladies might be thinking, well, it sounds like this series is, is probably just for, for guys. Not so. This is for everyone. Now, it's especially relevant for, for us men because women tend to be more naturally inclined to social connect. Us guys, not so much, but I assure you, this is for all of us. It really is. Now, perhaps you've noticed in your travels through the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that Jesus' friendship with the twelve and his closer friendship with the three, that's, that's well known. But if you were to look carefully, you would also notice that woven through the story of Jesus in the Gospels, there is a small circle of women who have a special bond of friendship with each other and the common denominator the the reason why they they know each other and have become close to each other is because they're all followers of Jesus now we see some of them at the foot of Jesus cross we see some of them at the scene of Jesus resurrection and there are some other junctures during the the life and times of Jesus where we see these these women show up and it's evident that these ladies have a closeness, sort of a, a girl's night out kind of connection with each other. And, and coincidentally, out of, out of the, the six ladies that were sort of in that group, four of them had the first name Mary. No wonder they felt a kinship. You got Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, Mary the mother of Jesus, Mary the wife of Clopas. And then there's Salome and Joanna as well. So I called this series Peter, James, and John. But it might well also be called Mary, Mary, and Mary. The point is, we all need to have a few faithful friends. And where better to find some than in the family of God? 
Some of you just missed a great chance to say amen right there. Now listen carefully. When we make this life-changing decision to believe and receive Jesus, you know, somebody explained the gospel to us. And what do you know? We responded in the positive. We said, yeah, yeah, that's exactly what I need. I need a savior of my soul. I need forgiveness. I need change in my life. I need Jesus, the spiritual re rebirth that he came to offer to us because you know, we understand Adam and Eve, they, they were the ones that got us all into trouble. And we've all inherited that, that fallen sin nature, that crazy sin factor that has all kinds of, of unwanted side effects in humanity. And, and so if we're honest with ourselves, we, we, we realize that, hey, we have been messed up by, by that, that sin issue and we need a Savior and we need Him to change us from the inside out. So when we make that intelligent decision to say, Jesus, please come into my life. Be my Savior. I want to be spiritually reborn and I want to get on with following you for the rest of my life. When we make that decision, wow, not only are we receiving Jesus as our new BFF, our best friend forever. But we are also coming to realize that, that in receiving the Lord, we also receive some brothers and sisters in this family. When you're introduced to the Savior, you're also introduced to the family of God. And you know how that works. You start attending a local church. You start meeting some new people, some fellow believers, you know. Christianity opens up for us a whole new social network, right? It's kind of like getting married. When you get married, you don't just marry a spouse. Man, you marry into a family, right? It's a package deal. And there could be some crazy uncles and some eccentric eccentric aunties in, in, in this, this new system of, of in-laws that we are now becoming acquainted with. But, but hey, in the family of God, there is going to be some terrific people that you come to know and, and appreciate. And, and so th this, this, is, this is par for the course, man. When you become a Christian, you are going to discover some new relationships with others who also claim to be followers of Jesus. And this is a good thing. So you'll meet new people. You cannot get to know all of them on a very close personal basis. But may I say this? Hopefully... There'll be a few of these people that we discover, that we add to our friend collection, that we add to our Christmas card list, right? Hopefully there'll be a few people that you come in into relationship with now that you're a part of the family of God who can become to you like a Peter, James, or John, like a Mary, Mary, and Mary. You know, I've often said, there's two things that I know for sure. One of them is... Everybody needs the Lord. Oh, yeah. Everybody needs the Lord. Whether they will admit it or not, whether they know it or not, or if they do know it, whether they'll act on it or not, the fact still remains, everybody needs the Lord. The second thing I know is we need one another. Oh, yes, we do. We need one another. We all need a few close, trusted friends. Now, there may be some people who will be hearing this message this morning. And you might be saying, Pastor, I tend to be more of a private kind of person. Honestly, I'm, I'm content to not have those close-knit friendships like what you're describing. Pastor, I've been hurt a time or two. And, and, and to be honest, here's where I'm at. I have some pleasant acquaintances. Pastor, I've got some good working relationships with people. I have some casual contacts with fellow believers. And I'm fine with that. I don't particularly feel the need for closeness. Hmm. So you're a stubborn customer. Huh? Listen, can I ask you to do two things? One is, hear me out. Come on, just, just open your heart to take in the Word of God, what we can learn about Jesus' relationship with Peter, James, and John over the course of these four Sundays. Would you just hear me out? And then secondly, would you pray about it? 
Would you talk to Jesus and say, Lord, come on, is, is this something that I really need or, or can I be exempted from, from this part of, of the Gospels? Lord, I, I, I just would rather, rather not get real close to people. So, Lord, can I be excused from this or, or, or is this something that I really need to embrace? Would you, would you hear me out and then would you hear the Lord out? Because if you make it a matter of prayer, I believe that he will answer prayer for us. You know, the story is told about a handful of doctors who, who worked together, but they also played together. These guys, they loved getting out on the golf course. And so one Saturday morning, the one doctor, he was at home about to sit down to a, a breakfast of waffles and, and, uh, and berries and cream with his kids and his wife, and his phone rang. So he stepped aside, and, and it was one of his doctor golfing buddy guys, and and, and, and the guy on the other end of the phone said, hey, there's three of us over here at the golf course and, and we need one more guy to make a foursome. Can you come? And this doctor who was at home with his family, he said, I'll be right there. And he hung up. And he got his coat on and he's about ready to head out the door. And, and his wife, she couldn't, she couldn't help but overhear the, the tone of seriousness in, in his voice when, 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 when he said, I'll be right there. And and she said, honey, is, is it something that's quite serious? And he said, yes, in fact, there's three doctors already on the scene. Now listen, that question begs an answer. Pardon me, that story begs an answer to this question. How does his wife feel about her husband's friend? How does his wife feel about her husband's friend? Now, what if this lady were to find out somewhere along the way, she finds out that the reason why her husband did not spend that Saturday morning with his family was because he was spending it with his golf buddies out on the golf course. How will that woman feel about her husband's friends? Or for that matter, how would any woman feel about her husband's friends? Now, the answer to that question can come in three different ways. So here again is the question. It's a crucial question. We really need to weigh this and wrestle with this. How does a woman feel about her husband's friends or lack thereof? The first re response, the first answer to that question is she feels troubled about her husband's lack of friends. She feels troubled because her husband doesn't have guys that he can hang out with, guys that he can relate to, guys that he can enjoy the company of. And, and this woman feels a little bit troubled inside. I mean, she says, I'm a friend to my husband, but I want him to have some, some male friends that he just really enjoys hanging around with and doing things with. And so a woman can feel troubled deep down inside because she's disappointed that her husband doesn't have some close friends in his life. The second way that question can be answered, how does a, a woman feel about her husband's friends? The second answer to that is she feels very happy. Because her husband does have a few choice friends. She, she says, man, my husband has got three or four guys that he just really enjoys hanging out with them. And he finds, a, he finds a proper balance between time spent with his friends and time spent with his family. And, and she's happy for her husband because of these guys that he has in his life. Because she feels like he's a good influence on his friends and his friends are a good influence on him. They're, they're good guys. She knows his friends, and she knows that these are, these are good men. Possibly even these are godly men. And so she, she is particularly uh, gratified by the fact that I have a husband who has some close friends, and it's really healthy for him. All right, so that's, that's answer number two. Answer number three to the question, how does a woman feel about her husband's friends? The third answer as you might be anticipating, is that a woman can be deeply concerned about the fact that her husband does have friends, but those friends are not exactly a great bunch 
for her husband to be in the company of. She has concerns about his friends. She knows a thing or two about his friends, and she feels like maybe his friends are having some, some kind of a, a bad influence on her husband. And so she's concerned, maybe deeply concerned. So that's the third way that that, that question can be answered. But my goodness, this is a question that looms very large, and, and we need to consider it. How does a woman feel about her husband's friend? Of course, we could turn the tables and, and we could ask the question this way. How does a husband feel about the friends that his wife associates with? It works both ways, doesn't it? And I'll tell you what else. It's a question that is also true with children. Every mother knows exactly what I'm talking about when I say that a mom is concerned about the fact that her sons and daughters, that they don't have any friends that they feel close to, friends that they can chum with and play with and, and do things with. There are some moms who feel very sad for, for their kid because their kid doesn't have a set of Friends, or she feels really disappointed because her, her, her children, regardless of what age they are, she feels that her children have some friends that are not a good influence. And she's concerned about her kids' choice of friends. So it can go that way as well. But for the mom who has some kids that have some, some friends that are really terrific friends and, and she knows their family and, and she knows that these are kids that have just a beautiful spirit about them and she has no qualms whatsoever about about sending her, her kids to play with their friends. Wow, happy is that mother. She's a joyful mother of children, as the Bible says. And it's entirely gratifying to her to know that her, her kids are, are, are hanging out with some, some really great friends. These are things that we really need to consider. And of course, I understand in the light of COVID, it's a little bit different, difficult for, for friends to be hanging out with friends, but COVID will pass. Listen, I got to bring this in for a landing, but here's what I'm asking this morning. This is the introductory session, and over the course of the next three Sundays, we're going to build on this. We're going to talk about how can we do this? How can we, how can we act on, on this model that Jesus has shown to us about how he had a group of close friends that he was connected to? How can we get that, that same thing working in our lives? We're going to talk about this in the next few weeks, but I'm asking every one of us to make a commitment. What's good for Jesus is good for me. Please do not back off from this. Please do not, not, not allow this to be a message or a whole series of messages that goes in one ear and out the other. Something that we hear, and maybe we even say amen to it, but then we don't do our homework. We don't do our due diligence. We don't act on it. We don't get this thing happening in our lives. Please, let's not do that. Let's make a decision that is a group decision. Let's make a decision that is a household decision and a personal decision. I am going to take a hold of this teaching series, and I'm going to run with it. So help me, Jesus. I know it will take some time. I know it will take some effort on my part. But Jesus, just like you had your Peter, James, and John, I want to have mine. I believe that the rewards of this kind of friendship are incredible. The payoff is massive for us and for a whole generational line that will follow us. Our kids and their kids will benefit from the fact that you and I chose to show this kind of example to them of having some great friends in our lives. So let's get this working for us in the weeks ahead and and But uh, before we wrap up our service today, I want to lead us in a simple prayer of faith because it's possible that somebody is taking in this online service today and, and you've never made that decision to say, Jesus, I need you in my life. I want to make that square one choice to become a born-again Christian. My friend, if that's you, 
Would you join me as we just pray this prayer of faith? And if you're sitting there today and, and uh, you know the Lord as your Savior, you've been walking with Him for years, pray the prayer with me anyway, just to reaffirm your love and loyalty to Christ. Come on, let's pray this. Dear Jesus, I certainly invite you to come into my life. I receive your gracious offer of salvation. Lord, I know that you're the Son of God. I believe you died on that cross and you rose from the grave to deal with my sin issue and to give me a brand new start. Forgive me, Lord, for all I've ever done wrong. Cleanse me with your blood. Fill me with the Holy Spirit. Help me to live the Christian life with some great friends around. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Well, hey, Gateway, the blessing of God be upon you and your uh, family this week. And, and as this week unfolds, may I just encourage you, be on the lookout for some of, those, some of those little indicators. I pray that as this week goes by, that there will be some instances here and there along the way that will be a, just a clear message to you. Wow. It's really true what Pastor was saying. Friendship is so valuable. So let's allow the Lord to do this work of friendship in every one of our lives. Amen. God bless you, Gateway. We'll talk to you next Sunday. Uh, but uh, I think we're going to wrap it up with a few other uh, announcements that Rebecca has for us. And, and so Rebecca will give you the final word. Thank you for joining us for Church Online today. We hope you were encouraged by today's service and feel refueled to take on the week. Just a reminder, if you're gonna join us for in-person next Sunday, make sure to register on Tuesday at 2.30 for one of our four services. We hope you have an awesome week and feel God's grace in everything that you put your hands to do. See you next week, Gateway.